I wanted to know what is it that we can do as uh, lay people to help ourselves. And there were many, many books, and specifically one book um, by Dr. Bernie Siegel called Love, Medicine and Miracles. That was the one that got me, you know, really thinking about these ideas. Um, about being an active participant in your healing journey. And he speaks about you don't just hand your file over to your docs and say, fix me. That there's a role for the patient to play. He knows himself better than anyone else knows him. He's not just his blood tests or his scans or his cancer markers. He's so much more than that. And we have to bring all of ourselves to our own healing journey. And this was really like, wow, for me. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Living the Next Chapter. I have another great author on with me today. We're going to be talking about some amazing stuff, and I'm so happy to have my author on from a place far from where I am. And uh, we're going to get into that and talk a little bit today. Devorah's on with us today. Welcome to the podcast. Nice to have you here. Thanks, Dave. Hi. Welcome, nice to welcome. be with you again. We were just talking about the fire that's going on beside me here, and it's nice and warm here in Canada today, so um, I want to just give that give this warmth to you from Canada. I'm sharing it with you. <laughs> Welcome to the Thank podcast. You. Um, yeah. Can you let everybody know where you are in this great world of ours? Yeah, I'm in Israel, and um, so that's like in the center of things. And I've been living here for the past 11 years, and I came to live here from South Africa, where I was born. And uh, yeah. And it's um, really enjoying living here. Yeah. It, for me, I would love to, I've never been to Israel. My father has been to Israel, but I've never gone. I love history. Uh, anything to do with history. Uh, walk where people have walked and see buildings and all that. So I would love to come and just do that. That would just be my happy space yeah. to do that kind of walk. And Actually, you can't walk more than a few meters without touching history here. Right. So... Um, you know, there's stories all over the place. And uh, actually, since I've come to live in Israel, I've like, taken up a hobby of uh, hiking. And uh, wherever you go hiking here, there are monuments and stories of what took place. There's a lot of history and archaeology mm. connected to the place. And it's it's not just a regular hike in the forest. There's always a something, a story to be told. And it's really wonderful. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I've a met a history. few authors from Israel lately. And uh, it's it's amazing to to have people on from your part of the world to come on to the podcast. So you're in good yeah. company. I've had some really great authors come on. So this is great. Fantastic, fantastic, awesome. Okay, so let's um let's go back in your story a little bit because I think it really adds to your writing and where you yeah. are as an author. Can you kind of take yeah. us back a little bit so the audience can get an understanding of a little bit about your background as it relates to how you've been able to pull that into your writing. Sure, sure. So, um, well, really it was a, a trust in faith that got me on this path because I started off my career as an interior designer for many years. I had a, my own business doing that. I'm very creative. I loved it. And then when I was uh, 25 years old, my father got ill with cancer and uh, that opened up a new door for me of uh, really wanting to know what what to do to make the body well what can the patient do you know in my desperate attempt to try and save him i was like reading whatever book i could find you know to understand what's the role of the patient and um, unfortunately he didn't live very long after that but my curiosity was piqued mm. and um, i wanted to enter the world of healing to help people be well as well as myself I also wanted to be well I wanted to know what is it that we can do as uh, lay people to help ourselves and there were many many books and specifically one book um, by Dr. Bernie Siegel called Love Medicine and Miracles mm. that was the one that got me you know really thinking about these ideas um, about being an active participant in your healing journey. And he speaks about you don't just hand your file over to your docs and say, fix me, mm -hmm. that there's a role for the patient to play. He knows himself better than anyone else knows him. He's not just his blood tests or his scans or his cancer markers. He's so much more than that. And we have to bring all of ourselves to our own healing journey. And this was really like, wow, for me. 
And then a few years later, I couldn't like stop this pull and I went to study reflexology and decided to change careers. I thought I'll help people be well through their body and I'll work on the hands and their feet and we'll do that. But this turned out to be quite frustrating for me because it was limited because people would cry when they were at me and say, why do I have to be sick? I don't want to have cancer. I'm too young for this. And I'm like, I don't know why. Mm, yeah. um, and they'd say, oh, why can't I have a baby? I just want to have a baby. I'm like, I don't know why. Let me get your uterus ready. Let's get the hormones ready or let's get the immune system working. But I couldn't help with the why me questions. And mm. I really wanted to. And um, that's when I came across Dr. Viktor Frankl and his teachings in his book, Man's Search for Meaning. And he was a survivor of the concentration camps and the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And uh, for four years, he had been in the, the camps, four years, which is a really long time. Wow. And uh, he, what he actually felt, he was himself a neurologist and, and, and psychiatrist. And what he felt himself was that he was part of an exclusive human experiment that was going on, that everyone was the same. Everyone had no no clothes, no belongings, no money, no furniture, no names, no hair, no identity. Everyone was identical. They all ate the same, slept the same, worked the same. But he wanted to know why were some different from others? If the typhoid was going around, how come everyone didn't get it? And he wanted to know how come someone could give away half their piece of bread to someone they thought might need it more than them and then still wake up the next day. So he, even though he was one of the prisoners, he started studying human behavior. Wow. And he wrote about um, really looking at not why me, but what now. Like when everything has been taken away from you, and that was the situation he was in, you still have choices. Mm. how to show up you still have a choices of are you going to smile at someone are you going to give a kind word will you give some inspiration to someone who's in desperate need of it yeah. and he says that you you can always choose your own attitude in any situation so when i came across his readings i wanted to help my clients who were saying why do i have to be sick or why can't i have a baby or whatever else their wires were and I also wanted to know my own whys. Why did my father have to die? You know, why yeah. why do why does why does life happen the way it happens? And I found studying logotherapy, and actually the word logotherapy, the word logos means meaning in Greek. Yeah. And logotherapy is all about finding meaning in our challenges. Because circumstances, we can't choose the circumstances, but we can choose the response to the circumstances. And this is, I found to be very empowering, that when we can show up to mm. our circumstances with our own attitude, then that is when healing is going to take place. And the more I studied, the more I was able to help people and just really loving, bringing the mind and the body, you know, together. It wasn't just let me fix your body, but let me help you with your mind and your anguish as well. And then I went on to study, I think I'm like the eternal studier. Mm -hmm. I went on to study um, bereavement counseling. So I wanted to help people with their grief and their challenges. And after that, I studied somatic experiencing, which is trauma therapy. And this, I felt, was a beautiful language that tied everything in together, the mind, the body, and the soul. The things we carry, we all have traumas. Nobody I know, other than Mickey Mouse, lives in Disneyland. <laughs> you know, um, yes. we all have life. We all have life. We all have struggles. We all have challenges. We all have things in our life that suck. Mm. And that doesn't have to be the end of the story because we also all have choices on how we're going to show up to these things. And this is what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate on working with people to resolve their traumas from the past and to understand the messages their bodies are giving them and the opportunities for growth that the illnesses might be offering them. And not that we go out to seek challenges and difficulties, but they come to us, unfortunately, they do come. And uh, this was my background. This was my background, and this is how I love to, to work with people, which became then a book. <laughs> nice. So I, yeah. I, I I wrote down again, not why me, but what now. I love. Yeah. I love yeah. how you frame that and and bringing that yeah. to the to the podcast. I'd love to just kind of talk about that a little bit more because I think that's something that could really 
help shape people's mindset. Just, yeah. just thinking about that. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? I love yeah. that. Yeah, because when we're in the why me black black mode, we're mm-hmm. in victim mode. Like yes. well, this happened to me, and I have no choice about it. And that might be true, you know. But but there is always a place. And this is what he taught us, Victor Frankl, in the concentration camps. He said he knew at the end of every day there would be a sunset and there would be beauty that he could experience Mm -hmm. in this hell of a place he was living in. And he said that was what he looked forward to every day. He knew it was coming, right? Or the full moon that would shine down on the earth offering some hope. And he could find these things and he could tap into them. Because if you sit in the why am I in this place and why is this happening to me, you can't be mobilized to action yeah. and he was actually inspired by something from Nietzsche which was um, he who has a why to live can bear with almost any how mm. right? yeah. so this was something that he taught that if you can find your your why for living if you can find something about the future you've still got something to contribute to this world Right, you've still got something to give to the family members around. You still haven't written that book you wanted to write, or you haven't contributed to this organization like you wanted to, or you haven't done this. When you know that, then you still have a reason to want to still be here. Mm. And when you are sending that message and that energy into your body, then that is having also a, a response on your immune system, right. and your nervous system. Right. And um, so the the what now is when you can move into action. And actually, um, many years ago, I had a client who came to me, also a young mommy who had cancer. She was absolutely struggling with with her overwhelm, as it is hard to be a young mom. And um, and the ill the the illness was draining her, and the chemotherapy was flattening her. She was like a doormat. And she said, what she wishes she could have is like some volunteers who could come, like some teenagers who could come and uh, help out with the kids in the afternoon. She wanted to have, she had the resources to pay for it. And there was this beautiful organization that that people could donate to anything that they had surplus. So at the time I was just a reflexologist and I donated reflexology sessions. But people who had like spare timeshare points for holidays that they couldn't use, they would donate that. And people would donate all sorts of things. And so she decided she was going to open up a branch in this organization that would enlist teenagers to help young mothers who have cancer. So it was like a win-win situation. Teenagers who were looking for something to do in the community and young moms who would receive this. It was win-win all around. And she hated this thing up and she was the first beneficiary And she just found how incredible it was. And, you know, when we give um, of ourselves, it's meaningful for the giver, for the receiver, for everybody. So it was really a beautiful something that started. And at the end of all her treatments, thank God she was well and healthy. And she said, you know, I never knew it was in me to start, you know, something like this. But it has become so meaningful for so many young mothers who are unfortunately suffering from cancer that she she continued the project afterwards and she didn't know it was in her to organize something like this she didn't know and she'd organized a great service to the community Mm -hmm. right so she said had i not had cancer i would never have been part of such a meaningful project right so so what i find is that when i can help people respond not react, you know, respond in a way and find this is in my life. There has to be a reason. Um, I'm going to look to find that reason and see what I can do about it. Yes. So I find it very meaningful to help people to to look at that. It doesn't help to say, oh, it's raining, it's raining, it's raining, you know. Yes. It helps you when you put on your umbrella and take your raincoat and your galoshes and get out there and then you can move in the rain. It doesn't yeah. help to say oh, it's raining again. That's yeah. that's being why is it raining? But I like to help people respond to what now. This is in my life mm-hmm. and it's terrible. And even I find it a privilege to work with people who are like terminal patients who know that they are not going to change their prognosis. 
you know, then then to help them see, well, what now? What can they still give to others around them? How can they teach the loved ones who they were hoping they could still teach their loved ones how to live in a certain way, but right. now they maybe have an opportunity to teach them how to die in a certain way. Mm. Wow. There's still the choices that we have. And so a topic which is very meaningful for me is the difference between being healed and being cured. So okay. I'd like to know more about we, that. That's good. Yeah. So we all know this is like 100% guaranteed that all of us are going to die at some stage. We just don't know when that's going to be. But we know that there is, that's the, you know, the mortality rate will be that. It's a, it's as taxes, death and taxes are guaranteed for everybody. <laughs> yes. Right. Exactly. So knowing that the goal of life is not to live forever. But the goal of life from a logotherapy perspective is to fill your days with meaning. Mm. None of us know even in a few hours what's going to be. Right. Which means today is really, and this moment is all we really have. So let's do it well. And I love that because the name of our podcast is Living the Next Chapter. So I exactly. love where you're going with all of this because yeah. it brings in that's the title beautiful. of the podcast. which Yeah, I'm, I'm that's so really happy. beautiful. Yeah. Having the next, that really is a beautiful time. So for me, um, the difference between being healed and being cured, it is a whole chapter in my book, is um, all about that sometimes people can't be cured, but that doesn't mean they can't be healed. Right? right. That, that, that even we see there are monks who die from cancer, doesn't mean that they, they weren't healed, it means they weren't cured, right? We all have the opportunity to have healing, even if we can't be cured. Someone can live with an autoimmune disease, which they know they're going to have forever, but mm -hmm. they still can choose how they respond to it. Maybe they can start a support group with it. They can help others. Mm -hmm. You know, what can you do with what you've got? And you can find healing through that, right? There's an attitude that we can always choose. And this is what Dr. Viktor Frankl was was teaching us that um, that we we always have the freedom to choose um, to choose how will we respond to the situation. Yeah, yeah. So it, it seems like when you lose the will to continue, when you give up, when you you can't do any more. <laughs> that's when things seem to deteriorate because yeah. you have yeah. you have told yourself that you know it's inevitable and i give up and i've yeah. seen people in our family who have been strong very strong people and when they get to a point where they feel like they can't do anymore they quickly yeah. begin to fade right yeah. because they've given yeah. up right can you talk a little bit about willpower yeah. as well yeah. So actually, Dr. Frankel speaks about this as well. It's one of the, the concepts of logotherapy is hope, okay. right? That people who have hope, he also speaks about faith, but people who have hope can, if you can see something in the future, like, like when I work with cancer patients now, so, so one of my, um, my clients at the moment has been asked to organize a school reunion. She's got cancer and, and it's tricky. And she said to me, I don't know if I should organize it or not. And I said, organize it. You know, because that is sending a message that I'm planning for the future. I want to be in it. Mm. Whether we'll get there or not, we have no control of it. But making plans for it is sending an internal message mm -hmm. to, to the body. Right? So hope is something and Dr. Frankel would walk around in the in the camps and he would speak to suicidal people who had given up hope and he would say to them and encourage them, you've got a son in America, I'm sure you want to see them again, or you've got that book that you wanted to write, you haven't done it yet. Mm. Don't give up on those things. Right. And when we have hope and when we have plans for a future, then we we can will, um, will that type of thing in our body as well. And it also doesn't mean that if it doesn't come about that we failed. Right. It just means that there were other plans for us. So for me, I always try and encourage it. That hope is such a big, um, a big thing. I remember reading once about this woman, 
um, she was in the hospital and she was dying of cancer and her daughter came in and brought the Vogue magazine. And it was the middle of winter, but she bought the summer, the, you know, the new summer collection of handbags, whatever, and her and her mom were flicking through them. And her mom said to her, wow, this one handbag is really beautiful for summer. And um, and her daughter said to her, mom, you should order it. And she didn't know if she should or shouldn't, you know, because mm. she wasn't sure if she'd be there for summer. And, um, and she decided to order it. And she said to her daughter, what do you think? And her daughter said, for sure you should order it. And she said she got like a message from her daughter, like, you'll need this bag in summer. And so she ordered it. And that gave her hope. And she made it to summer. Nice. Right? So we don't know what it is. And, um, oh, I've forgotten her name now. One of the scientists says, Candace Pert. Oh, the brain's still working. There you go. Candace yeah. Pert. <laughs> <laughs> she says that our brain is the largest pharmacy that we have access to. Wow. It's huge. It's wow. huge. Because when we go into that place of ordering the handbag or planning the reunion, we are sending a very strong message to our body. Right. And that gets leaked out with dopamine and serotonin, which boosts immunity. Right? And I guess so, the opposite would be true then, right? The opposite is true, like you That's said. Right. As soon yeah. as you give up. As yeah. soon as you give up. And there are stories of that. He tells a story, Dr. Frankel, of um, one person who had some dream or premonition that on New Year's Eve of, I don't know, 1942, the war, or 43, 42, the war was going to end. And, um, and, and, and managed to get to the 30th of December and the 31st of December, went to sleep with hope and never woke up the next day because, mm. You know, because there was no more hope after that. Yeah. Right? That was the last thing that they were holding on to. So hope, I think, plays a huge component in our mindsets. And also, I think it's something that it allows us through our attitude to be able to have some control. Like we might not have control. We could be living in horrible situation or we could be living through COVID or we could be right. in lockdown or we could be in, I don't know, a, an earthquake in Turkey. Like yeah. We could be in terrible external circumstances, but we can still choose our attitude, how we're going to cope with it. You know, you can be, um, you know, you could have one blanket with you and choose to share it with the person next to you. Right. Or you could be just you know, caught up in everything that you've lost. Or you can, you know, even even a beggar who receives a sandwich can share it with their friend. Mm -hmm. Like we always have choices of what we can do. And as long as we feel that, then we still are in control. We are steering our boat forward. Mm -hmm. So you talked so at the beginning of our episode that when your your father was ill and you were on a search, on a quest to find answers and resources, had you found the book that you've written back then, yeah, how would have you been more prepared? How would you have got better answers knowing what yeah. you've learned and what you've written? Could yeah. you take that book back in time for a second and given it to yourself? What would you have taught yeah. yourself? That's really quite nostalgic because I feel like, each chapter of my book that I've written, like one of the chapters is post-traumatic growth. Mm. We can grow through traumas. Like when my father was diagnosed, it was like someone pulled my life out from underneath me, the life yeah. force. Yeah. Um, and, and I didn't know anything about growing through difficulties. My life had been kind of Disneyland up until then. Mm -hmm. And um, had I known that sort of thing, it would have given me hope. It would have given me tools because I had to work these things out myself. Right. You know, I, until I found logotherapy, I didn't know there was such a thing. Yeah. So having known these things earlier, I suppose, you know, all of the challenges and the difficulties and the like the the wading through the swamp along the way has made me who I am. So I don't know if I would change it, mm. you know, but yeah. I, what I do feel is that the book is a beautiful tool to help people who want to help themselves. It's um, each chapter is about like the mind body connection. What is illness? What are your choices? How you can use your attitude? 
how you can be an active participant in your healing journey and what is the difference between being healed and being cured what's mm -hmm. the role of forgiveness like i have really meaningful chapters are written to be able to help people who want to help themselves and that's what i really love because i really see myself actually in the hebrew language the word is very beautiful it's called a melava right and the melava is someone who accompanies others on their journey right mm. the the word um melava I, I just feel the word is a very strong word mm -hmm. of that's what i want to be in someone's life i want to accompany people on their journey i don't want people to be reliant on me you fix me no and that's what this book is about it's about here are tools these are tools they work there. I have it's jam packed with personal stories of my own life, how I found healing, and of my clients' stories of how they have been able to find healing and inspiration to overcome challenges and difficulties. And I think another thing is that when people read stories, because I always believe there's there's actually um, a, a great sage from a Jewish sage from the past. His name is Rabbi Nachman. And he tells stories. And his thing is that people think of stories as something which, you know, put us to sleep, bedtime stories. But he tells stories to wake people up. Mm. And I love that idea. Yeah. It's stories here to wake people up. And I know that throughout my book, there are stories, many, many stories of empowering stories of what have happened to people and what people have done with the challenges they're dealing with. And why I love to share them is because when you read a story and you're going through something similar, it gives you hope. Mm -hmm. It gives you strength that if they got through that, maybe I can get through this. That's why I love to share stories in each chapter. There are stories, hard mm -hmm. stories, um, celebrating stories, good ending stories. And there are, are stories that, you know, also didn't go so well. It's, it's, I think, I feel like it's a real book to help people on their journey through challenges and, um, difficulties and also in life, but also specifically with health. And, um, and I have loads of case studies, which I really, really enjoy. Yeah. So, okay. So when did the book come out? The book came out in October. Okay. And actually it was supposed to come out the December before that. My deadline was hmm. the, the end of December 2021. Okay. But on the 27th of December 2021, I had a terrible accident and my, the book was finished. I had written the acknowledgements. Everything was ready to go to print. But I had this terrible accident and I fell on my head and I broke my neck. It was a terrible accident and I, I fractured my C2. Whoa. And... Um, the doctor who came to me after my CT scan just said to me, you, um, you're you lucky to be alive. You're lucky not paralyzed. Don't move. You've broken your neck. Right? So this was like, <gasps> yeah. and because of all these chapters and all this work and all this years behind me of all my research and everything I've learned, I knew I'm going to be okay. Mm. I didn't know what okay would be. And I didn't know what the road ahead would be, but I knew I had the tools to get through whatever that journey, and it was a five-month journey of recovery, would look like. And um, I feel so blessed that I had that, and then that became another chapter in the book. <laughs> Bonus chapter, how I broke my neck and wow. how I used the tools in the book to help me recover. So that was, you know, an extra, which I feel has... Um, when people hear that, you know, you like also I thought to myself also on that day when they told me, I'm like, who breaks their neck? Like, no who hears of a story like that? And <laughs> um, and I knew it would then be also something I will um, I will teach about and speak about and lecture about and encourage other people about. And this was something Dr. Viktor Frankl, when he was in the camps, he thought one day as he was working on menial work on the on the railway tracks, he thought to himself one day. I'm going to lecture about how I overcame this to wow. a room full of university students. And once he had that image, he knew where he was going. Mm. And I could also feel that when I broke my neck, um, I thought to myself, I am going to ace this because I want to help other people who are going through other difficulties like that. Wow. I want to be able to tell them how I got through it. And I also want to be real about saying, you know, I couldn't sleep at night because I couldn't turn my head. 
uh, I had to shave off all my hair because the brace, every time I turned on my pillow, the brace pulled my hair. So I had to deal with other difficulties and challenges, you know, of, you know, having to hmm. cut all my hair. There was, there was so much along the way. And, and, uh, I write about the challenges and I write about the the learning and the meaning I was able to attribute to everything I was going through. So I feel like my book is really an offering to people. Like you say, like, had I got that book when I was uh, 26 years old, yeah. it would have, would have been pretty awesome. But the, the, it, it is like, I feel like an offering for people to, to find and to have and to read slowly and uh, to be able to overcome the, I feel that it's, it's tools to overcome the challenges that they might be experiencing. Yeah. Great. What a great yeah. resource for readers too, right? And that's what I'm excited to, to share the message yeah. behind the book because yeah. the 26 year old version of you there might be somebody yeah. listening today who is where you were and they're going to start, yeah. they're going to start with your book as their resource, right? Yeah. And go wow. from here. And that's exciting. Yeah. Right. It's very exciting. As you say that, I actually feel a warmth in, in my solar plexus, See. you know, like, like it's a privilege. I feel the work that I do um, and to accompany people on their journey. It's, it's like godly work mm -hmm. and it's a privilege. And even like for my book to get out and, and when I meet strangers who say, wow, I've heard a podcast of yours or I've, I've, I've heard a lecture of yours on your YouTube channel, mm -hmm. I just feel so blessed that that with today's day and age of um, social media and so many ways right. of reaching people that, that one can. And actually the title of my book, um, which was really was inspired by Dr. Viktor Frankl, his book is Man's Search for Meaning, and mine is called Man's Search for Healing. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel very connected to the name and to logotherapy and to be able to help people on that kind of journey. It's a very high calling that you have accepted yeah. and yeah. A, a meaningful journey, I think. Like you talk meaningful. about walking with people and and being there with people as they go through some of the toughest days ever yeah. in their lives. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. there's not a lot of joy sometimes in that walk, but there's yeah. company and care and love and yeah. accountability. There's all those things come into place and, and it can be very lonely, right? Yeah. Like I'm thinking of, you know, um, sitting there with your with a parent who is usually the one that gives you care and now you're yeah. caring for them, right? Yeah. And not knowing what to do. That's a lonely place to be. So Very I love true. the idea that you come alongside people and yeah. and help them. That's a, it's a yeah. high calling. I, I'm, it's amazing. And it's a privilege. It it's is. a real privilege. Because like I was saying to you earlier, like we don't know when the end of our life will be. And, and something I try and do at the end of every day is just think to myself, like, did I do today well? You know, like if I'm not, like I think every day I always say to my clients, if you woke up breathing, you've got a second chance. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you messed up yesterday, you can repair it today, right? If you wake up breathing, you've got another chance. But none of us is guaranteed to wake up breathing. You know, I heard just this week of a 97-year-old man who died peacefully in his sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, how how beautiful, you know, yeah. to have such a, a nice transition um, but it, it's not guaranteed for anyone, but we know it's going to happen at some stage. We don't know yeah. how. But that if we could ask ourselves at the end of our day, like, did I do today well? You know, that's what I want to ask every day to myself. Like, did I do it well? Did I use the gift that was given me? Did I use it for service of myself and of others? And I really believe that each each one of us is so unique and we've each come here with like a song to sing mm. or a painting to paint or a book right. to write or a, something to bring to the world. And and if we don't do that, then we kind of like rob the world of who we were meant to be. Wow. And so, yeah. so every day I love to like hold myself accountable to that. Even I have, I had one client recently who had a, a terrible birth trauma that I was helping her through. And she stopped in the middle and she said to me, how do you sit there? and listen to all of this pain. And I said to her, you know, for me, firstly, it's a privilege that people can share it with me. 
But secondly, I know that you don't have to sit in this pain forever because I have tools to help you. Mm. And I want to help. Yes. And, um, and so that's how I consider it, you know, knowing that like if you, if you touch one person's life and, um, and you can help heal one person's life, then they are, you know, ripple effects yes. into so many worlds around them as well. So that's why I say it like feels like privilege and like holy work because because it is in, in Hebrew we have a concept of tikkun olam, which is the healing of the world. That each of us can play a role in that, even in a small way. We don't have to all be Viktor Frankl. We yeah. can just we know, and that's not what we've been tasked to be. Like you have been tasked in your life to be Dave Campbell. Mm-hmm. I've been tasked in my life to become Devora, yeah. and 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 hopefully. If we're on that right path, then we can get that done, you know, and that's how I want to serve people to be on their path. And I want to serve myself by, you know, doing the best that I can. I love it. So Devorah, yeah. how, how do people reach out to you? Cause we've talked so much about how you help people and you work with clients. And yeah. um, I'm curious about that. And on top of that, yeah. the book, as far as the resource, yeah. how do we connect yeah. with you? Because I would, I think there's going to be people who want to continue the conversation with you and reach out to Wonderful. you. What's the best way? Yeah, I'd love that. So, uh, my, firstly, my book is called Man's Search for Healing, and it's on um, Amazon. You can just Google that. And um, and um, my name is Devora Kerr, D-E-V-O-R-A-H, and the surname is K-U-R. So you can just look for that. And my website is dkwellness.co.il I also have a YouTube channel and and maybe Dave I can send you and a Facebook page and DK yeah. Wellbeing and people can look for that on Facebook and the YouTube channel you can search my name I'm sure you'll find it and um, I would love people to contact me let me know what you thought of these ideas and um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I'd love to carry on the conversation. For me, that that's what I absolutely love connecting with people. I love it. You have a very kind heart, Devora. Like, thank you. I, I love talking to you, and I know you've helped many people, but you're going to help many more people. And yeah, it's nice to have you. you on to to bring to bring a spotlight to what you do and 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 why you care for people because that is yeah. that's meaningful to me to, to just to hear your story and. Yeah, I'm so I'm so happy to have met you and to to have time with you. And thank you. And I have have thoroughly enjoyed talking with you. You ask beautiful questions and you elicit (laughs) also the meaning from me, too. So thank you. It's been wonderful. Awesome. So a great book for everyone. Please go and support Devorah. All the information will be in the show notes. That way it's really easy for you to connect. And I would love for you to give her a message and and let her know that you heard her on the podcast and let her know what part of the podcast really spoke to you as a listener. I think that's very meaningful. And when you buy Devorah's book, please leave a review because that tells other yes. people <laughs> how meaningful this book is and how this book can help someone. So please do that. Yeah. Every time you buy a book from a great author, leave them a review and encourage them with your words. That's the one thing that you can do as a reader. You can use your words, just like Devorah's using her words to help people. Use your words as a reader to help the author by giving a review. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Devora, for being part of the podcast. Okay. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you for being here on Living the Next Chapter. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We enjoyed having you here on the podcast. Our authors are amazing. I hope you appreciate their time, their effort to make this possible. If you know an author, if you want to recommend an author, that's a good idea. Hey, if there's an author that you really would love to hear about or hear from, if you tell me, if you send me a message, you speak pipe on our website, livingthenextchapter.com, send me an email, over to livingthenextchapter.com. Send us a message. We will forward your message to that author and say, listen, you are being requested to be on Living the Next Chapter. Our audience can't wait to hear from you. You can help shape the show. Yeah, yeah, you. You could do that right now. 
Actually, you got a minute, right? Okay, how about you do that? LivingTheNextChapter.com. We'll see you over there. Recommend an author. Yeah. See you. Thanks. <laughs>